Hey, welcome back to Mindset Rx. I'm your host, Dr. Robin McKay, and this is your place to be if you are a positive, emotionally intelligent, intuitive thought leader, thought worker in tech, healthcare, and any other high performance field, and you're ready to set the tone for a positive, productive, and purposeful week, month, year, life, legacy, all the things that I always talk about on here. And today, we're talking about something that, honestly, I can't believe we have to keep talking about. Not because there's anything wrong with you when I, when I bring this topic up, but because I've been talking about it for so long, I thought that at some point we would get past it and we're just not there yet. And so that's, that's fine. That just is kind of the nature of the beast when it comes to being high performing and high achieving and very smart. And the topic I'm talking about today is if I'm so smart, why do I feel like an imposter? We're talking about the imposter syndrome today. So I'm looking forward to this conversation because I think it's one that bears repeating. It's one that I've personally experienced myself over the course of my career. It's something that we wrote about in our book, Smart Girls in the 21st Century, which is all about the psychology of gifted and talented girls and women. And it's something that has actually been experienced by generations now of women who are high achieving, who are very bright, accomplished, successful. And yet there is that inner thinking, inner feeling, inner experience that not only do I not belong at this table, that's part of it, but the other part of the imposter syndrome is that maybe I've led people to believe that I'm not as smart, accomplished, talented, expert, and maybe they're going to find out about it. So if you can relate to that, you're in the right place. If you happen to be here on LinkedIn Live with me, say hello in the comments so I can say hello back to you. If you are listening on the podcast or on YouTube, welcome. Leave leave a note in the comments and let me know that you've joined us. And you can always reach out to me on email, Robin, R-O-B-Y-N, at drrobinmckay.com. And let me know. Let me know what you think. Let me know how this episode served. And of course, as always, I am here for you. I'm here for your high performing, high achieving teams in tech, healthcare, medicine, and other areas where there continues to be a paucity of women at the highest levels of leadership. And I'm here to change that, as you know. So welcome to it. Let's dive into the content today. And I'm seeing, as we do dive in, I'm seeing, let's see. We have Doc Angela here. Congratulations, by the way, on finishing your doctorate. So excited and happy for you. And, you know, it brings up a really good point. I have my PhD. Angela's got an EDD. There are other very accomplished people who are going to be listening and watching this episode. And it doesn't seem to matter how many degrees we collect. It doesn't seem to matter how many promotions, how many raises, how many awards, how many acknowledgements we've received over the course of our careers. There can continue to be this inner battle that we have with ourselves and with how we're meant to be of service in the world when we think that we have the imposter syndrome. I do, just as a side note, as I'm starting this episode, want to say I, I spoke about this earlier in an earlier episode, I think it was in maybe September of 2021, and we'll drop the link to that episode in the show notes. But it was based on an article that came out in the Harvard Business Review in February of 2021. And the title of it is Stop Telling Women They Have the Imposter Syndrome. And the whole premise of this research that these two authors did was that If you're feeling like you're the imposter in a room, it could very likely be that the room has been set up for you to feel that way. In other words, if you are not of majority culture, if you don't look like the leadership in the room, if you're somehow different than 
what's expected a leader might look like or be like or speak like or have their hair like or whatever it is. If you're somehow different than what's expected, it's a setup, basically, that the systems and structures have been put into place to make outsiders feel like outsiders. And there are people who um, have an advantage in those situations. And certainly, I think that that is, it adds a nuance, right, to this conversation around what's the imposter syndrome anyway. And I really like that. When I first saw the, the headline of that article, I thought, that's pretty genius. What if we don't have the imposter syndrome? What if it's not us? What if there's nothing wrong with you or me or anybody else who thinks that they have the imposter syndrome? What if the whole system, what if the matrix is set up to create the conditions for us to think that we're outsiders, to think that we're imposters? And if that's the case, how does that change the conversation? How does that change the game? So at some point today, I'm going to talk about some psychological strategies that you can put into place to support yourself as you navigate leadership, um, as you navigate the tables where you might be one of the only, where you might be very different from everybody else at the table. And um, we're gonna we're gonna just dive into that. So let's go ahead and get started. The first time I re really remember thinking that I had the imposter syndrome. I think I was maybe like 27 or 28. I was working in the biotech industry. I didn't have an advanced degree. I had an undergrad in biology and everybody around me who I worked with had master's degrees, had PhDs, had MBAs, had all of these degrees and credentials that came after their names. And in tech, in biotech, in some of these industries, credentials mean everything, or at least I thought they did. I didn't understand that there were other factors involved in decision-making in the hiring process that went beyond just the credentials, the degrees, and the experience. I didn't understand that they also wanted people who were good writers and good thinkers and who could figure things out even if they didn't have those degrees and credentials behind their name. So that kind of put me at what I perceived as a disadvantage because I didn't. In fact, I even justified my lower salary by saying, well, but I don't have my master's degree or I don't have my PhD. And at that time in my life, I was still getting raises. I was still getting promotions. I was still being tagged for these projects that I felt like I was a little bit in over my head on, but I was somehow able to rise to the occasion on them. But the, the feeling inside of me was somebody's going to find out. Somebody's going to find out that I'm not as good as I claim to be. And it occurs to me that actually wasn't the first time that I experienced the imposter syndrome. That was the first time professionally, but the very first time I experienced the imposter syndrome was six or seven years earlier when I was a freshman or sophomore in college. And I had been through Epstein-Barr virus, I had mono. I had moved eight hours from my hometown to go to college, so I was on my own by myself. My parents had gone through a big divorce, I had fallen in love. I had all of these social and emotional pressures on me and on my system, not to mention the physical pressure that a virus like Epstein-Barr creates in the system. So I had all of this stuff going on internally. I didn't have the insight that that was all that was going on. All I knew is that I didn't feel as smart as I used to be when I was in high school. I graduated third in my high school class. I got scholarships to college. I had kind of the world by the tail. And I don't say that in it, with any arrogance, I just say that I was healthy and I was happy and I was excited about the future. And I knew where I was headed, which was for a Gen X girl was pretty cool and pretty unusual too. But by the time I got into college, that was really when everything physically, mentally, and emotionally started spiral spiraling down. I had anxiety and depression and difficulty focusing. So I had some ADHD symptoms coming online as well. And it was at that moment, I think that's when I could really pinpoint that maybe I'm not as smart 
as I led people to believe to graduate third in my class in high school and to get this scholarship and to have these experiences as a young woman just starting my career. So functionally from then, from the time I was 19 or 20 until I was 27 or 28, so for around eight to 10 years, I was operating under that assumption that I just wasn't as smart. I was a really hard worker. That's what I would say. I, I just got lucky and I was a really hard worker, which you and I both know hard work and luck is a part of the success process that we've been trained into, but it's not the only thing. And certainly it wasn't something that was congruent with what all the testing said about me, what my grades said about me, what my accomplishments said about me earlier in my life what those things, those markers of accomplishment and success would have said was that she's the real deal, but I didn't feel like the real deal. And maybe you can relate to that. Maybe there's something inside of you that makes you wonder if you belong at the table. Maybe there was even a mind game that you're playing with yourself around. Once I get my credential, once I get my degree, once I get to this, this marker, then I'll feel like, I belong. And then you get there, you get your degree, you get your diploma, you get whatever it is that you thought was going to make you feel like you belong, and you still don't feel like you belong. So regardless of where the influences come from, whether it's the systems and structures that are set up to create the conditions for people who don't look like the majority culture to feel out of place, or if it's an internal process and the likelihood that it's a both and not an either or, but regardless of where that comes from, we have to, for once and for all, take a look at what's it going to take, what's it going to take for me to shift gears, for me to pull myself out as best I can of this belief that I don't belong, I don't fit in, I'm quite different from everybody else, and therefore Perhaps I have fooled them into thinking that I know more than I do, that I'm smarter than I am, or that somehow I just got lucky and worked hard and accomplished all that I have. Does that make sense? Because what's at stake here is your capacity to actualize that which you came here to do your capacity to lean into your highest potential. That's what's at stake. Because the imposter syndrome, we know that it's false. We know that it's a false self. We know that it's a, um, something that has been embedded in our consciousness just by virtue of being human. We know that. But it doesn't take away the pain of it. And unless and until you're willing to look at that and actually extract it from your system and start running on something other than the fear that somebody's going to find out that you're somehow different from how they think that you should be, you can see how screwy that is, can't you? But unless and until you do that, you're going to be trapped in this system where you're not going to be able to actualize where you're not going to actually be able to lean into your highest potential. Because how dare you? So I posted the announcement that I was doing this talk today on the podcast. And my co-author, Barb Kerr, who was, she's actually the lead author on Smart Girls in the 21st Century. She's my mentor, longtime friend. Um, helped raise me as a psychologist in when I was in graduate school. She commented on the post and she said, well, everybody knows. She said, you probably know this too, Robin, that for me, she said, I just always figured that everybody else sitting at the table were imposters too. And I thought, oh, well, that's pretty genius. That's a really great psychological strategy. So here's the first one for you. Just assume that everybody else sitting at the table also feels like an imposter. Because the likelihood is that they do. There are a few exceptions, of course. 
but especially when it comes to gender disparity, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation disparity at leadership tables, chances are if there's somebody else who doesn't look like majority culture for whatever reason, they're going to feel like an imposter too. I mean, I acknowledge, listen, I'm a middle-class white girl. And I look more like majority culture than most. And yet, when we look at distance from privilege, which is something that we write about in Smart Girls in the 21st Century, if you haven't picked up that book yet, I recommend that you do and read about it. Read about distance from privilege and read about the imposter syndrome in that book. But when you look at distance from privilege, the further out you are from the center of power and privilege, meaning the further you are away from being a white, male, wealthy, Christian guy, the harder it is to get shit done. The harder it is, the more hoops you have to jump through, the more barriers you have to break down. And even literally distance from centers of culture create distance from privilege. So yeah, I have a lot of assets and did when I was a kid, I had a lot of assets. And I grew up in a very small town in rural South Dakota. I didn't have access to a lot of the, you know, summer camps and the, the training and the teaching and the arts and the sciences and all the things that kids who came from big cities had access to. And it maybe slowed me down a little bit, but in terms of my self-esteem or who I was at that time, I really felt less than. I mean, I moved from South Dakota to Nebraska to go to college. And I remember I was at a party at Creighton one day. I didn't go to Creighton. I went to a small women's college, Catholic women's college, St. Mary's nearby, but I was at a Creighton party and somebody asked me where I was from. And I remember saying that I was from South Dakota, but I said it with such shame. I'm, oh, I'm just, from, I'm just from South Dakota. As though that was somehow less than being from Nebraska because we didn't have big cities and we didn't have arts and culture. Well, we did, but it was in smaller doses. But even where you're from can affect how you feel at any table. So I share this with you just to give you some perspective from my own experiences. This is not everybody's experience, but I just want to share that because the further away you get from the center of privilege, the more likely it is that you're going to feel like you have the imposter syndrome. But I want you to remember that it's constructed, it's intentional. And when you make a couple of psychological shifts, you can start extracting yourself from that so that you can just sit at any table and just be who you are, be who God created you to be, be who you know you are in your heart and make the contributions that you know that you're meant to make, regardless of what you look like, where you came from or anything like that. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, you can take Barb's advice for that psychological strategy of just figuring that most people sitting at the table also feel like they're imposters too. I remember I talked to one of my girlfriends a while ago, we were talking about the imposter syndrome and just how creative, talented, smart people just generally feel different from everybody else. And she said she remembers going to kindergarten and feeling like everybody else in kindergarten were robots except for her. Talk about feeling different from everybody else. So the other thing that you can do psychologically is just ask, how is my difference an advantage? We are living in a world where diversity, inclusion, and belonging is a major focus, as well it should be. And one of the things that I know for sure about diversity, inclusion, and belonging is it's not just the color of somebody's skin or their gender or how they identify but it's their diversity of thinking. So it's multidisciplinary. It's how, it's your perspective. When you come from a perspective of psychology or from education or from tech or from business, 
everybody has a unique perspective and that unique perspective adds to the conversation. It makes a contribution that only you can make because of the lens, the filter through which you are viewing the world. And that contribution is additive. Not only is it your education and training, it's also where you came from. It's also how you see the world. So when we look at diversity, we also have to look at diversity of thinking and diversity of disciplines. And that's one of the reasons why when I go into organizations, tech organizations in particular, I'm a psychologist. Yes, I have a background in biotech. Yes, I speak science, but I also speak the language of the heart and the language of spirit, the language of creativity. And it's at that intersection that I can connect and relate to them and contribute in ways that they're calling for that they may not even know that they need yet. And maybe that's the same for you as well. So what about this? What if we shift the conversation from I'm an imposter to I'm a unicorn? I mean, unicorns are magical, mythical creatures. Let's just flip the script. Let's wave the magic wand. And invite our imaginations to just wonder about what is my unique contribution at this table. And as you do, you can kind of feel yourself settling into, yes, I am unique. Yes, I am different. And that is exactly why I belong at this table. Not because I want to look like everybody else, because in fact, you've heard me say, if you've been around for any period of time, you're not meant to be a clone. You're not a robot. You're not a cog in a great machine. You're a human and you have a unique perspective. So as we shake the foundations of the structures and the systems that have been in place for as long as they have, one of the biggest contributions I think that we can make is to shift the conversation and no longer allow ourselves to have the experience of feeling the imposter. Let's eliminate that from our consciousness. Why not? And I always feel that I have to add as best we can, because it is a process. It's something that I work with privately with my accomplished high-performing leaders on, because this happens even at the highest levels of leadership. Women sitting at in the C-suite will say, I feel like I don't belong. Well, of course you don't. You're one of the only, of course. And yet that's the very reason that you're there is because you don't belong. Because the outsider has an advantage for creativity, for innovation, for, for diversity of thinking, for vision. But whatever table you're sitting at, and wherever you have in the past felt like an imposter, one of the best and most effective ways of lifting yourself out of that consciousness of the imposter is to link arms, to be part of a community who believes you and believes in you. It's one thing to go out and do your work in the world and to be one of the only to be, for me to be the only psychologist sitting at the table, for you to be the only African-American woman sitting at the table, or the only LGBTQ plus person sitting at the table, or the only Latina, the only Muslim, whatever the only is for you. It's one thing to do that, but it's, an, it's another thing to do it when you know somebody's got your back when you know you're not alone, just because you're the only doesn't mean that you have to be alone. And that's one of the reasons that I do the work that I do is because one of my gifts is gathering very bright, talented, intuitive women together to see each other and to see that we're not alone. Leadership can feel lonely. Being the only at a table can be lonely. It's less isolating when you have a community that you know you belong to. So that's why I'm here. That's why I create 
created the actualization zone on Facebook. If you haven't joined yet, you should. We'll drop the link in the show notes. It's a free Facebook community, but it's one that is a community of my heart because it's gathering multidisciplinary, intelligent, and intuitive women from all disciplines, from all walks of life into a space where we can see each other, be seen by each other, and lean into the process of actualizing our highest potential. So I share that with you just as an invitation, because I think it is important here and now for us to really begin forming a collaborative, a collective, someplace where everybody comes together. And then you know, even when you're sitting at the table, even when you have that niggling feeling that, oh, maybe, maybe I'm not quite as good. Maybe I'm not quite as smart. Maybe I'm not quite as accomplished as I've led them to believe. And maybe they're going to find out you can come back into this beautiful space and say, I just had this experience today. And the people in that community help you remember who you are, who you actually are. So part of me wants to say, so come over and join the other imposters because we all feel like imposters, but you know, the truth of it is that we live in a world where anybody who's got a gift, anybody who looks different from the status quo, anybody who's not, who's zigging when everybody else is zagging, anybody who's an innovator, a creative and intuitive, and who's also very smart is already an outlier. So let's own that. Let's embrace it. Let's flip it on its ear and see what kind of innovations and see what kind of transformations we can bring into this screwed up world we're living in. All right. So come over and join the actualization zone. I'd love to have you over there with us. And I'm going to be back next week with another topic on mindset RX, which are psychological strategies for being on purpose for living a positive life and making a contribution that opens up new worlds for yourself and other people. I am Dr. Robin McKay. I am not an imposter. I am the real deal and so are you. And I'm so happy that we are connected. I will see you next time.